All right, you are still watching Ways International Malala Day is celebrated on the 12th of July every year to honor and observe the bravery of Malala Yousafzai. I don't know how to pronounce that. Yousafzai, right? She is a woman from Pakistan who advocates and creates awareness about girl child education. She's also the youngest person to have achieved the Nobel um, Price. So, if you do not know Malala Yousafzai, right? That's how to. I hope so. Um, Google her. She's. I mean, her bravery till tomorrow is something that um, you know forever and ever will be worth you know discussing. Um, having to fight against societal norms in a very very heavy. Um, place where culture, you know, is quite, you know, strong against girl child education. She stood her ground, even took bullets, you know, for that. So every time that we have the opportunity to to celebrate this young woman, we'll continue to celebrate her. Norma, I know you have a lot of stories about Malala. <laughs> oh yes. And in the I guess in the spirit of uh, Malala, World Malala Day, um <laughs> Malala has decided to spend her birthday this year in Nigeria. So she visited the vice president today and she calls for girl child education, which is actually my what's in the news for today. It was interesting to see that she decided to spend her time in Nigeria and um, part of her agenda was actually to talk about the girl child education and how important it is for the girl child to get an education. Of course, from her own experience, you can see that she is very passionate about education for young women as a key to transformation within any government or any government. So um, she spoke today with uh, some correspondents and she had said in her words, she says, I'm here in Nigeria to celebrate my 26th birthday. Since my UN speech at age 16, I have been going around the world, meeting girls from different parts of the world and raising awareness about the issues that the girl that girls face. And there are more than 120 million girls who do not have access to education right now. And um, even as other people spoke about her education, she wants to be able to speak for other girls and get other girls to think about education for other girls as well. So she had visits to uh, the vice president today was... Um, she says that it was well received and uh, she had received support from Nigeria and uh, the Nigerian government. And she was also asking that the Nigerian government support the girl child um, education. She was able to visit uh, places like Abuja. She was also in Borno and she said she met a lot of intelligent girls out there. And um, it was important for the government all tiers of government um, to make deliberate efforts to send girls to school. I think it's a very commendable um, venture that she has um, embarked on. And um, it, it's something that is highly recommended. I mean, she has used her voice in a way that people did not think possible. For someone who's coming from a country like Pakistan, where women did not have the opportunity to for their voices to be heard. Malala represents young women. Malala was at some point represented young girls and the ability for an individual, whether female or you know otherwise, to be able to have a voice. And she has continued to use her voice to to make a difference. And this is um, really commendable. Using her birthday, normally in Nigeria, you have people celebrating Owambe and things, but she's using her day to make a difference all over the world. And this is this is really commendable. So happy birthday, Malala, and um, you are going to attain even more greatness in your lifetime. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. I like the part that you talked about Owambe and Nigerians. <laughs> like, you know, sometimes it feels like we just 
must, you know, do some things. I, I, I say to people, set your standards, right? Set your whatever it is that you want to do. I mean, when my son turned 10, he decided, no, mommy, I want to write a book. So he had been writing that book. So part of celebrating his 10th birthday was just to put together a few children and just, you know, launch his, his book. 17, I'd be seven years down the line, he did a conference around the same um, um, topic for that book, which was talent, right? He did a conference in his school as a parting gift, you know, since he's leaving the secondary school level. He did a conference to showcase talent, you know, beautiful minds and all of that. So, I mean, let your... So don't be pressured to want to be like every other person. You know, truthfully, if you find the quietness of yourself, you would know what you stand for. So you're not putting yourself under so much pressure and all of that, you know. Um, so your story, NJ. Um, well, my story is a bit of a downer. So um, a 63-year-old youth uh, football coach in Tennessee was arrested last week after his cell phone was left, he left his cell phone at a restaurant where the staffs allegedly found a, a trove of pictures and videos showing him drugging and raping at least 10 young boys. Jesus um, he was taken into custody and was charged with one count each for the rape of a child and sexual exploitation of a minor. Um, although many charges are expected from this case. And it's surprising that the you know, the Franklin police are saying that they saw, you, um, you know, there was evidence on his phone of child sexual abuse and the kids were approximately aged between 9 and 17 years. And, you know, um, it also states, they also revealed while carrying out investigation that during his um, off hours, um, his name is Campos Camilo on Tardo Campus, uh, that uh, Campus would frequently um, go by, there was a nearby school around the area where he lives, and then he would go around the playground. So it, it's, quite, it's quite disturbing when you hear, you know, stories like this. No, but how would he be able to access the children in the playground, right? Well, Except maybe if the school is also very lax with their security because you can't really i can't go to any school right now yeah. to say i want to enter their playground and you know speak no, to but you know nearby school playgrounds no i know school. i know abroad is different because yeah. we don't have the way we have fences and all yeah. of those things yeah, yeah it's so like, like, it's like an open, open floor plan but that's the more reason right a chaperone should always be in the playground watching the children because you don't i mean i i've i've, I've visited some schools in the u.s and i like um, primary schools right not some, actually one, where we're picking up my, my nephews and my, my nephew and my, and my niece. And, you know, you would always see teachers stand, you know, at strategic locations, you know, just watching. So for him to be able to access these children, yeah. that's what I'm saying that is actually very scary. No, but it, it happens. But then again, you know, they're human beings. They can get distracted. I can be talking to a parent and I'm just like, oh, it only takes a w one... No, but this is very point. sickening. This is very sickening. So, so he, had they not um, seen the con uh, content on his phone, this man would have just been now walking that's around. Now, coming to his 63. So today, maybe so today is that time. Imagine a... how long he has done Who this. To the point that he videos it. So this now is no longer just a sexual satisfaction. He's actually very, very sick. You know, these are the people that, like, when you say that you have a debased mind, that is the definition of a debased mind. And there was also evidence of him sharing that information. So that's why investigation is still going on, because they would have to trace maybe... All the people who sent the those videos and to. And maybe try and trace the network, because there's always a network to these things. Absolutely. Syndicate. Noma, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I wanted to say that because he is a soccer coach... There's a level of trust Access, as well, uh, and might be a level of familiarity in the because you don't, of course, in a school setting, you don't just allow anybody in there. So for him to gain access enough to be able to drop children and be able to commit the act, then there is some level of familiarity. And like we say in the um, uh, in circles of sexual abuse and abuse in general, it happens 
with someone that's familiar. Mm. It's very difficult for research, has it? That's very difficult for um, a complete stranger. Um, such things that you know, you know there are minute cases, there are there are unique cases, but it's very very. Um, it's more difficult for it to happen with a stranger and more often than not, it happens with a familiar face. So I guess as a coach, he already has access. He already has some level of trust and familiarity with the environment. Absolutely. It's very, very spot on. All right, so my story is actually quite interesting. And the reason I'm taking this story, Uti, if you are watching, this is for you. <laughs> Because she, she was the one that actually shared this video earlier today, but I, I thought it was, it was worth talking about. Now, the report, according to The Punch, says that Second Niger Bridge vandalized federal government orders surveillance. Now, according to the report, some road fittings installed on the newly commissioned um, Second Niger Bridge have been stolen by vandals. And in response, the federal government has ordered security personnel to begin surveillance patrol on the bridge and surrounding to prevent a reoccurrence. Now, a source in the works uh, ministry confirmed that theft on Wednesday, confirmed this theft on Wednesday, reporting that the expansion joint walkway on the axis 330 of the bridge had been stolen. Now, EC took a story yesterday around airport um, light fittings being stolen. And the report says that somehow, somehow, they find their way back to the airport being repurchased. Do you understand? Because they, literally, you cannot take those, those um, lights anywhere else. You have to, it's actually for airport use, so they would resell it to the airport. So there is a market for it. For these people to have the audacity to go and vandalize, I cannot just go and steal things like this when I do not have a market for it. First of all, they must understand that there's a market for it. So it's not enough for you to say as a government to say you have set up what's it called surveillance, right? What exactly are you doing as government to ensure that these things don't even happen, right? And I say this all the time. For insurgency or anything in security to last beyond 24 hours, there's some element of cooperation from the government, right? So it's not just saying that I like to blame government. No. What I am saying is that because two things, there has never been anybody that we have heard. I don't know about, you know, I've not heard of any conviction. I've not heard that they, they, they hung somebody for going to go and steal public property. It's never been done. There is a market for it, right? There is a market for it. That's why they will continue to do it. So you see people continuously vandalizing and what's it called? Government property. And you see this happen most times when there's a change of government. Because they know that this new government will, re they will revisit these things and put them back in the budget. So they will go back and say, you know what, this is business. We'll take these things that we have stolen and sell it back to you. And you also will buy it. You understand? Yeah. That's why it will continue. So for us to put an end to everything called public vandalism or whatever, we need to actually see strong measures. I was watching... Um, an interview this morning with one of the, the, the chiefs or something in Yonogwa. He was talking to Rufai and um, Dr. Abati or so on, on Arise. And he said something very, very potent. And that's the truth. That if a uh, federal government wants oil theft to stop today, right? If they want it to stop like it should end today, that it will stop. So what does this tell you? Are we like literally pretending not to know these real solutions to these problems? It's the same thing. All these government properties, it's not you and I that go to steal it, right? So we have to be very, very um, sincere with ourselves. We have to see some level of sincerity and transparency in the, the real measure of it that you really want to curb all these, um, what's it called, some of these challenges that we face. Because it's getting very embarrassing and it's too much. A newly constructed bridge, all of a sudden, things are, are missing from the, the, uh, from the parts of the bridge. That's very sad. So if the government is serious, they need to be very serious and not just make play lip service and say you are setting up surveillance. Surveillance will not solve the problem. If you catch anybody, cut their leg. You remember that? If you, if you remember vividly, I think it was uh, maybe like two months ago on the show that I um, one of my news story was um, that police had um, arrested uh, an elder, I think an elderly man that had stolen um, parts of the this third mainland bridge mm -hmm. and but right after that like since then there has been no conviction on that case 
So I understand your pain and I, I share your, your, your pain and concern because really, if they were to be persecuted, then they will serve as an example for other people. And not only that, before you can go and steal those parts, you go with full equipment. Yeah. And you are telling me. It takes me. a lot for you uh, to do that. No, that no. It takes Let's, stop deceiving. Let's stop deceiving ourselves, I beg. If you really want to solve this problem, federal government, you have answers to the, the, to the, to the problem. So please solve it. We'll take a break. When we come back from that break, let's see how we can manage ourselves and meet all of this um, uh, price inflations and all of that. And of course, how business, um, small businesses can be guided in price increments. Stay with us. We'll be right back.